thank you for this invitation to talk about my favorite subject and yours, not just about our happiness, but how we can bring it to other people. If I do my job, I'm gonna to talk to you about what I find the most interesting and fascinating science is telling us about this incredible field, something that can help engage us and, and give us some purpose. The purpose of happiness itself can animate us for the rest of our lives. Now, I teach this subject at Harvard University. You just heard that in that gracious introduction. Um, and when people meet you in the States for the first time, it's always the same question, what do you do? It's kind of an indiscreet question because it's really asking, what do you do for money? Hmm. <laughs> but when I say I teach at the Harvard Business School, they say, oh, accounting, finance, marketing, supply chain management, something practical like that. I say, no, 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 I teach happiness. And they think I'm lying. <laughs> How is it possible that this could be taught at a business school? Well, the truth of the matter is that the business of your life is your life itself. You're the startup entrepreneur of your life. But the currency of that incredible enterprise is not money and power and fame, it's love and happiness. You better understand how to accumulate that currency. That's how I approach the whole class. I have two sections of 90 students, I have 400 on the waiting list. There's even an illegal Zoom link they think I'm not aware of. <laughs> So where do we start? <laughs> the first question that I, 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 I introduce when I start the class is I say, you worked hard to get into the happiness class. You must know what it is. <laughs> and then I cold call them. It's the thing we do at Harvard. It makes them unhappy. I pull them out of the group and I say, answer the question. What is happiness? And they always kind of tell me the same thing. Happiness is the feeling I get when I'm with the people that I love. Happiness is how I feel when I'm doing the things that I enjoy. And I say, that's beautiful. That's really lovely. That's wrong. <laughs> happiness is not a feeling, and that's very important. We misunderstand emotions. If you're attaching your happiness to a feeling, it's a vapor that you'll be chasing for the rest of your life. Your feelings don't exist to make you happy. Your feelings exist to give you information about the outside world, and sometimes they're pleasant, and sometimes they're not, and you need to be happy because and in spite of all of it. Feelings are evidence of happiness, like the smell of your dinner is evidence of your dinner. Your dinner itself is something that's more tangible. It's actually a combination of three macronutrients. It's protein, carbohydrates, and fat. That's what your dinner is. That's not very romantic, I know, but... <laughs> But that's a good way to understand happiness as well. Happiness has feelings, which is the smell of the happiness. But happiness itself is really a combination of three phenomena. In the Declaration of Independence of my country, we talk about the, the inalienable right to pursue happiness. But that's too vague. We need to pursue three specific macronutrients in balance and abundance. Enjoyment, satisfaction, and meaning. Those are the three parts of happiness that the people who have the most well-being, they have in balance and abundance. And when I meet somebody for the first time doing what I do for a living, I can usually tell with a few simple questions whether people have a good and balanced happiness macronutrient profile and where they can do more work. So let's start this wonderful summit talking about those three macronutrients, those three objectives, those three great elements of living a happier life. Now, I'm gonna abandon this idea right from the very beginning because we all know that happiness per se can't be a destination in life, it can't be a goal. You are going to have suffering, you must have suffering, you should be thankful for your suffering. The road to happiness goes through a lot of unhappiness. But you can get happier. Happiness is not a destination, it's a direction. My co-author Oprah Winfrey says that the goal is happierness. So that's what we'll talk about today. And happierness means more enjoyment of life, more satisfaction, and more meaning. So how do we get more of each one? Let's start with enjoyment. A lot of people mistake enjoyment with pleasure. You know, there's a there's an old saying in the 1960s that the hippies used to say, the, the strategy for life, if it feels good, do it. <laughs> I remember my dad hearing that and saying, that's the end of America. Right? <laughs> 
he was kind of right. Anyway, <laughs> you know, the, the parallel to that, by the way, is if it feels bad, make it stop, which is a kind of a common motto today, especially among young people. We're, we're teaching people something really dangerous. And here's why. Pleasure, feeling good, can't be your life's goal. And to understand this, we need to open up the wonderful new world of the neuroscience of happiness. There's a, a theory of how the brain works. The brain is incredibly complex. There's no computer in the universe that could possibly even simulate the human brain. But to simplify it as much as we can without being reductive, there's a theory called the triune brain. Maybe some of you have heard it. It's been around for a long time. It suggests that the brain has three sets of functions that exist in order of, of evolutionary age. The oldest set of brain functions, the reptilian brain, detects outside signals. So right now I'm detecting a whole bunch of signals. I'm walking and talking and breathing all at the same time without thinking about it very much while I perceive the amount of light and the number of people that are here. All of this is automatic. It's amazing what my brain is doing below the level of consciousness. That's collecting data. It sends the data to the second part of the brain, which is slightly newer. The limbic system is a console of tissue deep inside the brain that was evolved between two and 40 million years ago. Neuroscientists also call this the paleomammalian brain because we have it in common with all the other mammals. This takes these outside detected signals and turns them into emotions. This is important. My students often talk about good and bad feelings. There is no such thing. There's no good feelings, there's no bad feelings. There's emotions, which are the information that we convert from the outside detected signals so we know how to behave and how to survive. That's what emotions are for, to detect threats and opportunities and tell us about them. That's all it is. Now this is important because if you want to manage your emotions so they don't manage you, you have to stop thinking about trying to get more good feelings or have fewer bad feelings. That's part two. The third part, of the triune brain is the most evolved part. It's only about 250,000 years old. That's the, the neocortex, the wrinkly outside of the brain. It's wrinkly, by the way, because it's a one square meter piece of tissue scrunched up inside your cranium. The most evolved part of that is the prefrontal cortex. That's 30% of your brain by weight, the bumper of brain right behind your, your forehead. That's the C-suite of your, of your brain. That's the executive center. That's where the emotions are delivered so you know what's going on and you know how to act. To approach something, to avoid something, these are the decisions that you're making right now as I talk. I'm saying words, you're detecting them in English, you're sorting them out. The emotions that you're feeling right now are informing how you're interpreting what I'm saying. That's your prefrontal cortex, that's amazing. This is what separates us from all of the lower beasts. My dog, Chucho. He's a good boy. Very little prefrontal cortex. <laughs> He's mostly just a living, pulsating limbic system. And that's why he loves me and I love him. But he can't think about the things that we're talking about here to strategically form the basis of his life. Now, why do I bring all this up? Because that detection, emotion, decision, algorithms going on all day long, it's amazing. The problem is that we cut that last link. We allow ourselves to be too limbic. And that brings us back to enjoyment and pleasure. Pleasure is limbic. Pleasure is animal. It's nothing more than a signal that says, this will give you calories, this will help you survive, this will help you get mates. Now, we twist pleasure in the modern laboratory into all sorts of things that will hurt us. But that's what pleasure is all about. And if your goal is pleasure, you will find addiction and misery. Now, I'm not saying, I'm no Puritan. I'm not saying get rid of pleasure. I'm saying that it's incomplete for happiness. You need to experience it in your prefrontal cortex where you can manage it and remember it. And that means you need to add two things to pleasure. People and memory. Pleasure plus people plus memory equals enjoyment, which is part of happiness. Now, now, this is important because this gives a strategy for life. I do a lot of work with different companies. I was working with a beer company recently. 
I noticed something in their advertising. They never featured a guy alone in his apartment pounding a 12-pack. Why not? That's a lot of how a lot of young men use the product. Why? Because that's the pursuit of pleasure, and that's sad and dangerous. No, no, no. The advertisement has the same guy opening a bottle of beer and clinking the necks of the beer bottles together with his friends or with his brother. Why? Because they know that beer plus people plus memory equals enjoyment, and that's part of happiness. Here's the rule. Here's the rule for life. There are lots of things that bring you pleasure that are not addictive, saying your prayers, walking in the forest. But if anything can be addictive and brings you pleasure, don't do it alone. That's when it gets dangerous. And that's when you can't actually turn it into the enjoyment that you actually seek. Now, why did I bring all that up about enjoyment? Because it gave me an excuse to talk a little bit about the brain upon which I want to build as I get to these more nuanced macronutrients of happiness, satisfaction, and meaning. Number one is enjoyment. Number two is satisfaction. Satisfaction is a really funny human phenomenon of the joy that you get after struggle. Only humans need to struggle. My dog, Chucho, does not want to struggle for his rewards. Doesn't want to. No, 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 no. If he could lie down and eat, he would do that. Right? But we, we humans, we want to suffer a little bit so that we enjoy things more. My students, if they, don't, if, they, if, they, if they cheat on my exam and get an A, there's no satisfaction. But if they work hard for it, even though it's a trivial thing, it's just a grade, they love getting that A because that's how we're wired to struggle first. You know, it's um, my father-in-law of now a recently blessed memory. He lived to a good old age, but he was born in 1929 in Barcelona. He lived through the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939, and it was his point of reference to everything. That's all he ever talked about all through the rest of his life. It was very traumatic. Spent time in a refugee camp. Uh, family members were assassinated. No joke. And the result of it was all his life's lessons came from the Spanish Civil War. Well, one time he said to me, you know, you're an expert in happiness, right? And I said, well, some say so. <laughs> Opinions differ, especially in my home, but. <laughs> he said, want me to tell you why people aren't happy anymore? I said, yes, I would very much like to know your opinion on that. He said, it's because they don't enjoy their dinner. And I said, huh, tell me more. And he said, people are never hungry. They're never hungry anymore. And so they don't enjoy their dinner. And since they don't enjoy their dinner, they're not happy. And I realized this reduces it to a relatively low level. It gets us back to enjoyment a little bit, but it's an important point. You tell your kids, don't eat before dinner you make up some excuse about nutrition. The truth is you want them to enjoy their dinner and make them suffer a little bit, a tiny little bit, with a little bit of hunger, right? He says, Christmas Day when I was a kid was the best day of the year. Because of Christmas dinner, we finally got to eat everything that we wanted. And it was so wonderful, I remember every Christmas. We're weird, we need to suffer. But that's important because if, if you avoid your suffering, you will not find your satisfaction and you will not be happy as you can be. That's the truth. Embrace the struggle. But it gets weirder, friends. <laughs> it's even more mysterious because <clears throat> then after you get that satisfaction, you think it's going to last and it doesn't. <laughs> Mother Nature lies because she doesn't care if you're happy. She wants you to survive and pass on your genes. That's it. She has a very, very simple strategy for you. You want to be happy. So she says, if you get that house, if you get that car, if you get that money, if you get that million Instagram followers, whatever your thing is, you'll enjoy it forever. But you know it's a lie. People say, you know, you know, people will actually get down on one knee and propose to their partner, if you marry me, you'll make me the happiest person in the world for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how marriage works. <laughs> Every day is a new day. <laughs> People ask, if I move to California where it's nice and sunny, will I be happier? I have the data. You'll be happier for six months, but the taxes are forever. <laughs> <laughs>
Make a wise choice. Why? It wears off. And the reason it wears off is because emotional highs and emotional lows can't endure. That's a process called homeostasis in which we return to our baseline physiologically and emotionally after a very short period of time so that we're ready for the next set of circumstances. That's why emotions exist, is to make us ready. Remember that. And so therefore, if they persist, we won't be ready and we'll be in danger. But we think it's going to last because Mother Nature is lying to us. When we don't figure that out, and you get to a goal, and it doesn't last or it's not satisfying enough, you say, I guess I needed more. A billionaire gets a billion dollars. It's okay. But he concludes, or she concludes, that I guess I needed another billion to get the feeling that I really wanted. That's called, in our business, you all know this term, the hedonic treadmill. The treadmill is a metaphor. Hedonic means feeling. I want the feeling. I want it to stay. Run, 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 but it's running against me. What do you do about that? That's a tyranny. Satisfaction is part of happiness, but it doesn't last unless you know how to hack the system, to stand up to Mother Nature's lies. Here's how you do it, courtesy of every religious tradition from time immemorial but it's hard. You're taught naturally and by society and by culture and by marketing and by the economy that the secret to happiness, to satisfaction actually, is having more strategy, more, more what? More money, more power, more pleasure, more fame, more Instagram followers, more whatever, more. But that's not the secret. The Dalai Lama says the secret to lasting satisfaction is not to have what you want, but what would you have? Here's the model. Your satisfaction, think about it this way in your head, is all the things that you have divided by all the things that you want. Haves divided by wants. Now you know enough of your, or you remember enough of your high school mathematics to know that you can try to manage the numerator but if you don't manage the denominator, which sprawls all throughout your life, the satisfaction is actually going to fall. Great friend of mine, wealthy friend of mine, said that he always dreamed of having enough money to buy a Mercedes in cash. He's a private equity manager. He said, that's how private equity managers know they're successful. They can buy a Mercedes in cash. I said, huh. Mercedes, something more like a drug dealer than a Mercedes, than a, than a private equity manager, whatever. And I didn't make too much of that. He said he was 32, he finally had the money. He went in and got his, he went in with a check and put it down. He said, I want my car. And they said, yes, sir. And they gave him his keys. And as he was driving it off the lot, he thought to himself, I should have waited a little bit longer and gotten the Ferrari. <laughs> because his denominator increased even faster than his numerator and his satisfaction fell as he was driving off the lot. What do you do about that? The answer is, pay attention to your wants. Chip away your wants. Learn to want less. Here's a practical way to do just that. When I was a younger man, I was taught I should have a bucket list. A bucket list. For those of you who are not from the United States or the UK, the bucket list is a metaphor of a bucket that holds all of your ambitions and cravings and desires. And on your birthday, you list all of those, those, those cravings and desires and ambitions, and you imagine yourself enjoying them and how successful you are be. The problem with that is it makes you feel woefully inadequate today because it increases your wants. Furthermore, it makes the satisfaction problem much, much worse. Today, I have a reverse bucket list on my birthday, and I have a big one coming up with a zero after it in two months. It's not 70. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to list all of my cravings. This is what I do every year on my birthday now. My cravings and worldly desires. Maybe I get them, maybe I don't. I do not want those to be encapsulated in my limbic system. I want to manage them in my prefrontal cortex so I cross them out. I will not be attached to this. I will not be dominated by this. I will not be managed by this. You know what's going on my list this year? Half, maybe more, of my political opinions. The great Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, who influenced generations of people all around the world and introduced them to the beauties of Theravada Buddhism, he said that our greatest attachment in modern times is to our opinions. Are you attached to your opinions? Hmm. You know what? I am. 
So I'm going to take my strongest political opinions, I'm going to write them down, and I'm going to cross them out. Not that I don't have opinions, but I'm not attached to these. These are not me. I need fewer political opinions because I need more friends. <laughs> so if you disagree with me on politics, come sit next to me. I want to hear what you have to say. It will not be a blockage to my love for you. That's what a reverse bucket list can do when you make the conscious management decision of your own life to want less and not to have more. That's satisfaction. Now the third <laughs> is the hard one, which is meaning. Michael Steger's in the audience here. He's the world's leading expert on understanding the subcomponents of meaning. When you say, what's the meaning of life? It's almost a joke, like you should sit at the, mount of a, the, at the mouth of a cave in the Himalayas and ask the guru, which I've done. <laughs> it's too big a question. So as Michael points out, you gotta break it into three sub-questions. Meaning, this is the why question of life. Everybody's asking you the what question, what do you do? Do they ever ask you why do you do what you do? You need a, an answer. And the answer to that question, it really comes down to three dimensions. Coherence, purpose, and significance. Coherence is why do things happen the way that they do? You gotta have a theory of the case. Significance, what are your goals and direction? What are you trying to do? And last but not least is significance. Does it matter that you're alive? Huh. I have a little test where I take those three and I, I bundle them into a two-question exam I give to my students, anybody who wants, and I'm gonna give it to you now. Do you have a meaning crisis? You're gonna know in 30 seconds. <laughs> because if you feel a certain hollowness in your life, this might be the reason. If you don't have answers to these two questions, you now know what to start looking for that will get you to coherence, purpose, and significance. Question number one, interrogate this inside your heart and mind. Why am I alive? Why am I alive? Don't give me biological answers. I wanna find the transcendental reason for your existence and, and what you're supposed to do, okay? Second question, now it gets harder. For what would you give your life at this hour? For what would you die today? Maybe, maybe that's an easy one for you, but it's not for a lot of my students. They, they don't really have an answer. And again, it's not good enough to have an answer that sounds good on TV or that would please your mother. It's your answer. And if you don't have one, good news, if you don't have answers to these questions, now you know what to go looking for to find those three dimensions of happiness. And when you see somebody find it, it's just, it's like watching a miracle occur in real time. My children are 25, 23, and 20. And when they're a senior in high school, each one is 18 years old, getting ready to launch the sort of official part of their adult life, I always make them write a business plan. I make my kids write a business plan because they're entrepreneurs of their own life business. And I'm the venture capitalist, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I get a business plan, fair is fair. It's really fun to be my kid, as you can imagine. My first son, who's now 25, when he's 18, wrote a rock solid business plan I was all in. My second son, Carlos, it was more problematic. Being my middle child, he was my problem child. I mean, it was, uh, you, many of you have a Carlos, and you know how it feels. It was, I would get a constant call from the uh, principal's office at his school, Carlos is getting a D in math, Carlos is not passing history, Carlos didn't show up today. Grades, application, motivation. My wife, who's Spanish and just such an optimist, she said, at least we know he's not cheating. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I asked him to write his business plan when he was 18 years old, and he turned in a business plan that was very unconvincing. I'm gonna go to college, and then I'm gonna play some sports. No, I sent it back for revisions. I said, I'm sorry, I don't believe this, you're rolling me. He said, how do you know? It's my life, how do you know? I said, you know why? Because I'm Carlos. When I was 18 years old, I went off to college doing what I was supposed to do. I made it 10 months in college before I was invited to pursue my excellence elsewhere. <laughs> you know, dropped out, kicked out, splitting hairs at this point. But my point is that I wasn't ready. And so, I went to work. 
through, from 19 all the way through my 20s, I made my, my living as a musician. I was a classical French horn player. I was in the Barcelona City Orchestra. It was a great life. My parents called it my gap decade. <laughs> <laughs> and I found the trajectory of my life by the end of my 20s. I went back to college by correspondence. I got my bachelor's degree at 30 and then went and did my PhD and did a new thing. But I needed to do that because I needed to understand the currency of my life, which was love and happiness, and it wasn't gonna come from somebody else's business model. So when Carlos turned that in, I said, do better. Show me how you're gonna go find the answers to those two questions. Then he turned in something I could believe. He left and he got a job on a farm. He got a job as a dry land wheat farmer in Idaho, picking rocks out of the soil and mending fences. He's the low man in the hierarchy. Any of you been to Idaho before? Of course not. It's far away. <clears throat> it's lovely, but it's remote. And then he did that for 16 months, and then the second part of his business plan kicked in. He joined the US Marines. And for four years, my son was a sniper a special operations marine. This was a very scary job for me, his father, right? I couldn't track his phone for long periods of time. He was on so-called field trips. <laughs> Not so fun. But he emerged four years later, which was three months ago that he left, as a man with answers to his questions. He's 23 years old, he's married, his wife is pregnant, He's got a job he loves, but most importantly, he has answers to his questions. I'm gonna give them to you right now. Not because these are the right answers, not because these are your answers, but because they're an example of a transformational set of answers for a young man's life. Carlos, why are you alive? Because God made me to serve others. For what would you be willing to die on this day? For my faith, for my family, for my fellow Marines, and for the United States of America and our allies, <laughs> and <clears throat> <laughs> so again, those aren't your answers, I know, probably, but those are good answers for him, and that's what we need to find. That's how meaning can change your life. Okay, now, one of the great mysteries because I want to be more practical before I finish up in my last seven and a half minutes, I want to give you something that you can really chew on to get these three macronutrients of more of the enjoyment and satisfaction and meaning that give you the full meal. What can you do very practically? And to begin on that, uh, let's just look at the, the strange mystery. You know, if I fed any two of you the same dinner, one of you would gain more weight than the other because you have different metabolisms. Your metabolism for food is made up of your genetics and your circumstances and your habits. And the same thing is true for happiness. Everybody has a different mood balance, a, a general happiness level to which they return naturally, notwithstanding the macronutrients I talked about before. And the reason is genetics and circumstances and habits. Good studies on identical twins separated at birth and, and brought up in different environments show that about half of your happiness is actually genetic. Your mother literally made you unhappy. <laughs> but, or happy, depending on your circumstances. And that might seem depressing to you, but it isn't. It's incredibly empowering. Because if you know your genetic tendency, you can tailor your habits to your circumstances. For example, the same studies on identical twins shows that half of your tendency toward alcoholism is genetic. But if one of you came to me and said, hey, Arthur, I got a, got a problem. What's your problem? My mom drank too much. My dad was a drunk. All four of my grandparents were alcoholic. I guess it's inescapable that I'm going to abuse alcohol. I'd say, no, 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 you missed a step. Because there's a special, new, incredible technology, it's very complicated technology, that will turn genetics from 50% to 0% tendency to drink alcohol. Here's the complicated new technology. Don't drink, right? <laughs> That's a behavior. If you know your genetics, you can manage your genetic tendencies with your behavior, but you gotta know your behavior. You have to know your habits, and I'm gonna get to that. The second tranche of your general natural tendency toward happiness is circumstantial, and most people think that circumstances are, gonna, are the only thing that matters. My students think if I get the job, I get the money, I get the family, I get the things that I want, then all will be well, and I say it will be temporarily but homeostasis. It doesn't last. That, again, that seems really frustrating, and that will, the circumstances temporarily, bring you up or down by about 25% off your baseline, according to most studies. 
but it won't last and therefore that shouldn't be your main concern, as hard as that is. What you should do is manage your habits so you have systematically better circumstances. And that leads me to the best news of the day. 25% thereabouts of your happiness is under your direct managerial control. With the right habits, you get 25% directly, you get, you get the circumstances that are better, and you manage your genetics as much as possible. Here are the habits. Here, this is the payoff. This is what really matters, the punchline of everything I'm going to be talking about here, because here's how you start down the road of enjoyment, satisfaction, and meaning optimally by doing these four things, by putting these four things into your account every day. Here they are. Your faith, your family, your friendship, and your work. Now, I have to be clear on this because I could be easily misunderstood when I say faith. I don't mean my faith. I'm a Catholic. It's the most important thing in my life. But as a social scientist, I will tell you, I'm not talking about metaphysical correctness here. People disagree on that. But I will tell you that anything that gives you a transcendent understanding of life will give you this benefit. And by transcendent, I mean you need to transcend you. Mother Nature wants you to be obsessed with your own little psychodrama every day. My job, my lunch, my career, my, it's so boring. It's like watching the same episode of the same television show again and again and again and again, and you can't stop, unless you have a technique for zooming out and getting small. Maybe that's studying the Stoic philosophers with utter seriousness. Maybe that's walking in nature, what the Indians call Brahma Mukurta, an hour and a half before dawn without devices when it's cold and dark every day. Maybe. Maybe that's, um, <clears throat> that's studying the fugues of Johann Sebastian Bach and standing in awe of their greatness. Maybe that's a Vipassana meditation practice, which I've studied and many of you have as well. Maybe that's the faith of your youth, but you need something, and you need it every day. That's number one. Number two, family. The mystical bonds that are so important that you didn't choose, and God knows you wouldn't have chosen in so many cases. <laughs> You know, it's funny because we can't quite explain. Now, of course, neuroscientists understand perfectly that we're a kin-based species, that we have to identify our kin and have an incentive to be bonded to our kin, and we have a neuropeptide in the brain called oxytocin that does just that. You lay eyes on and have contact with people who are in your kin, it's intensely pleasurable, and you will feel hollow and unsatisfied when you don't have that. That's the unique role that your kin plays. Your kin can be genetic, but also they can be adopted. I have one adopted daughter, no difference in oxytocin. People who are you know, in romantic relationships adopt each other as kin and get intense satisfaction from that as well. Here's the thing. We're being encouraged, just, and increasingly through media and politics and culture, to walk away from those relationships, to not form those bonds. One in six Americans is not talking to family members today because of politics. That, my friends, is happiness insanity. Don't let this happen to you. There's one reason to lose contact with your family and it's abuse, and differences of a political opinion are not abuse. News flash to America and to so many people around the world. You're walking away from your happiness when you let that happen. Third is friendship. I specialize in working with leaders, happiness with leaders, happiness in companies, happiness all over the world as much as I can. And leaders are the, some of the, I mean, I know you, many of you heard from Vivek Murthy, the great Surgeon General of the United States, who wrote a book on loneliness. Leaders are the loneliest people I've ever met. Not because they're not surrounded by people, on the contrary. They're surrounded by people constantly, and they actually have friends, deal friends, not real friends. You know the difference between real and deal. That's what matters. Do you have enough real friends, or are you too busy and have only deal friends? If you don't know the difference, by the way, deal friends are useful, they're useful to you. Real friends are useless. <laughs> I don't mean worthless, I have those friends too. So, <clears throat> but you need enough uselessness, just simple love in your life. People who love you and you love them and you don't need anything from them and there's no other purpose than the love. If you don't have enough of that, get after it and do the work. Last but not least is work. 
And I've studied work for a long time. I'm trained as an economist. And, and you know, I've looked at public sector, private sector, high income, low income, high education, low income education, blue collar, white collar. None of that really matters very much. It's all trivial. There's only two things that will bring joy to you from your work that you need to invest in and that you need to incentivize others with if you're a boss. Earned success and service to others. Earned success is being acknowledged and rewarded for the value that you create. You must be in something of a merit-based system. There's nothing more frustrating than creating value and having it go unnoticed and unacknowledged. You must be in a system where when you do more of value, that is recognized. And second, and even more importantly, is you need to serve other people. You need to see the faces of the people who need you. The essence of dignity is to be needed. And for most people, that actually happens through their work, whether it's work in the home, work in the workplace, paid or unpaid, they need to be needed. We need to be needed. People who work for you need to be needed as well. These are the secrets. So as I close, as my time is finished, let me, let me sum up. Sum up with a few lessons. And, and if you want, you can, I have a website that has these materials and things. If you can't remember everything I talked about, you can just download this stuff for free. But if you do, if you download a PowerPoint on this from me, do me a favor. Take my name off and put your name on and give the lecture <laughs> your way so that you can change other people's lives. To begin with, you can be happier. I'm not done, I'm not done, I'm not done, I'm not done. I gotta sum up, I gotta sum up. You can be happier, but you have to do the work. This doesn't come naturally and don't search for the feelings. Do the work. The work starts with, with, with pursuing enjoyment, not pleasure. And then understanding wants, not haves. And then answering your two questions. And then it comes from recognizing, to sum up a lot of what I said, is that happiness is love. Love for the divine, love for your family, love for your friends, love expressed to everybody in the way that you earn your daily bread. In so doing, you have an opportunity through the work that you do that you'll go back to after you leave this wonderful summit to earn your success and to lift other people up and bring them together, to serve other people through your work. And if you want to remember these ideas and apply them to your life, to make other people happier and to get happier yourself, you need to become the teacher of these ideas. Many of you are teachers of this, thank you for your work. Many of you are here to consume the ideas, but you must become teachers as well. Why? Because there's a reason for this summit, which is that we want not just inspiration, we want a movement. You want, yes, yeah, right. So, so let's think of this as missionary work. Right? Let's think of this information as missionary work. And remember, it's the last thought before I leave you. Think of the signs over the door that remind you as you leave this wonderful summit, that as you go back to your ordinary lives, armed with the information and ready to share it, that you and I are going into the mission field to lift people up and bring them together in bonds of happiness and love, using science and ideas, because a better world is possible starting with us. God bless you and thank you. If you enjoyed this amazing well-being content, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.